We're at Clattering Shaw's Loch to tell the story of constructing Clattering Shaw's Dam and later the most dangerous and difficult section of the Galloway Hydro Scheme, the building of Glenlee Tunnel. Part of phase one of the construction, Glenlee is served by Clattering Shaw's Loch, which are just over five miles apart from each other through hilly country. Clattering Shaw's Loch was made by damming the Blackwater of Dee with the largest dam in the scheme, as you can see. To bring the water down to Glenlee Power Station, a tunnel was built from an outlet on the loch through Glenlee Hill for almost six kilometres or 19,000 feet. But the difficulties with the project here began before its building. Much of the land needed for the reservoir belonged to the Earl of Mar. He had purchased it in 1927 on account of the exploits of his most famous ancestor, Robert the Bruce, in this area after the Battle of Glen Truel. Part of the farm included Bruce's stone, where he rested after the Battle of Moss Raploch against the English. The Earl demanded £4,500 for the whole farm, but the lawyer for the Galloway Power Company discovered he had paid only £1,200 for it when he had bought it a little over four years previously. The lawyer valued it at £1,500, so the Earl's demand was rejected. After lengthy negotiations, during which he tried to enlist Dumfrieshire MP Brigadier General John Charteris to help him by opposing the passage of the bill creating the scheme. Charteris refused to do that, but he did try to lobby the CEB on his behalf. In the end, the Earl settled for £1,900 for nearly all of the farm except for the stone and five yards around it. Soon afterwards, he donated the stone to the National Trust for Scotland. The Blackwater of Dee meandered through the marshes and low-lying land of Mossra Loch, so it was decided that this was good land to build the dam on. Marshy ground showed that it was already very good at trapping water. The purpose of this new loch would be like that of Loch Dune, to top up the water supply to the scheme in summer. A temporary rail line was laid alongside the dam site for the steam-driven cranes. These could be built and dismantled as required. John Hunter, who gave an account of working on the dams in Dull Rhyme Reminiscences, recalled building one in a single day. Crane drivers were among the best paid manual workers on site. A concrete plant was built to aid the construction at the east end of the dam and rock to mix with the concrete was quarried at Clattering Shaw's Fell, literally just over the road from the construction site. John Hunter, as we've previously mentioned, was a local who worked on the building of Clattering Shaw's Dam. He first started working for the contractor A.M. Carmichael, making access roads for Clattering Shaw's farm. He also worked on the bridge over the Pulloch Aqueduct. He learned to work with concrete on the project and worked on the very first batch of concrete for Clattering Shaw's Dam in the anchor block on the Craig Nell side of the dam. A.M. Carmichael employed a lot of older Irishmen and John felt he learned a great deal from them. John left Carmichael to work for Shanks and McEwen, where after a few months he was promoted to the Black Squad, who worked on building and using the cranes. They were expected to work hard and fast, evidenced by the fact that John took part in building that single 15 ton crane in one day. During the construction of Clattering Shaw's Dam, he worked on a crusher, which only worked when the other machines were not, so he actually had plenty of time to observe what was going on. There were a number of skilled labourers employed alongside the navvies, joiners, blacksmiths, sawyers, quarrymen and crane and engine drivers. In Dal Rhyme Reminiscences, John also published a poem alongside his piece on working on the hydro scheme. The poem memorialised a workmate who was killed after falling from the dam and being hanged on a wire. The men made him a coffin and were allowed to attend his funeral at Kells Church, but the time was, for that was deducted from their pay. In the poem, John makes tea for the ghost of his workmate and they discuss the afterlife while sitting on the scaffolding at the construction site here. The Glenlee Tunnel feeds Glenlee Power Station from Clattering Shaw's Loch, passing through the Benin and Glenlee Hills and is, in its entirety, 5.7 kilometres long. You can see the final section of it emerging from the hill here at Glenlee, where we are now. 
The water in the pipes drops 120 metres down to Glenlee Power Station here. The construction of the tunnel from Clattering Shaws to Glenlee took the bulk of the workforce hired for the scheme. Some 500 men were employed in its construction and was one of the biggest challenges in the scheme. It was certainly the most expensive part, totalling more than 10% of the entire construction budget. A temporary substation was set up at Glen Lee to power the ventilation of the tunnel, which was begun from several places at once to ensure it would be complete on time. A shaft was dug down from Craig Shinney to provide an extra access, and this shaft was later used to add additional water. The digging itself went faster than initially anticipated, taking 3.5 pounds or a kilo and a half of gelignite per cubic metre approximately. They managed to dig about 30.5 metres a week. Locomotives were used to help remove the exca excavated rock. The excavation was completed on the 10th of October 1933. The last shot of gel ignite was fired by Sir Andrew Duncan, chairman of the CEB, in front of 200 guests. They had all ridden in and out of the tunnel in the rail carts used by the workers. The tunnel, although cut from hard rock, was concreted after completion using a specially designed gantry. It was collapsible and articulated to allow it to negotiate the bends inside the tunnel. Two of the five men who died during the building of the scheme died in the tunnel and many of those who were seriously injured also sustained their injuries there. 60% of all injuries sustained during the project were here at the tunnel, which is why, if you remember, Reverend Hitman set up his first stage station here. There's a small memorial to those who died by Glenlee Power Station. The power station itself was constructed in 1934 and 1935 and is in many ways quite similar to Tunglin. Its turbines are smaller but taller and turn faster because of the high net head of water from clattering shaws. Arlston and Kursfad are remotely controlled from the station here as well. The station releases its water into the River Ken, right here, where it flows down into Loch Ken, through the Glen Locher Barrier and into the Dee, and to the final station on the scheme, Tongland.